Next up, we have Julia Novakovich of the Strong National Museum of Play presenting the history of play via archive space or what to do when you're the only archive space user at your institution. Julia will talk about how she works with archive space on a daily basis to provide the world with information about the collections in the library and archives of play. As a true power user of the application at her institution, Julia will address how she created her internal documentation and workflows, trains interns in how to use archive space for creating resource records after processing collections, and shares knowledge through public facing archives catalog through the public facing archives catalog. This session should be a great comfort to beginning beginner level users of archive space who work as loan arrangers or at a smaller institution. It's truly not that bad being the only one on staff who knows how to use archive space. Julia is the archivist at the Strong Museum of Play where she preserves and makes accessible primary source documentation such as papers of game designers, toy inventors, and video game creators. She is also an adjunct lecturer in the history and political science department at Nazareth College. Julia has appeared on the television quiz programs Jeopardy and Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. She co-hosts the weekly podcast Misinformation. We'll hold all questions, including Jeopardy questions, until the end. Julia, if you'd like to take it away. Of course. Thanks for the intro. So yes, as she mentioned, I'm the archivist at The Strong in Rochester, New York. Uh, the Strong houses the world's most comprehensive collection of toys, dolls, board games, video and electronic games, publications, and other historical materials related to play. Our mission is to explore play in the ways in which it encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and illuminates cultural history. Along with the Museum of Play, the Strong is home to the National Toy Hall of Fame, the World Video Game Hall of Fame, the American Journal of Play, the International Center for the History of Electronic Games, and the Brian Sutton Smith Library and Archives of Play. But this was not always the case. Um, we were originally founded as the Margaret Woodbury Strong Museum in 1969, and we opened to the public in 1982 with a mission to explore and interpret the cultural development and everyday life in the Northeastern United States after 1840, essentially dealing with the impact of expansion, industrialism, and the rise of the middle class. Two decades later, after an intensive period of research, planning, and expansion, in 2003, the museum returned to a mission closer to that of our founder's original intent. So Margaret Strong's treasure trove of dolls, toys, and other materials related to play became the focus of the museum. Exhibits became more family-friendly, interactive, and fun, uh, less Victorian furniture, more Sesame Street. And along with the mission change came a new focus for the research library and archives fewer 19th century land deeds from the Genesee Valley and more history of the video and electronic games industry. So when I arrived at the Strong in 2013, the museum had never had a professional archivist. Uh, there were just three modest play-related collections with existing finding aids. So I had the interesting, fun experience of coming into an institution and essentially starting the archival program from scratch. I established procedures and created policies, forms, and documentation. Since the archivist's office had essentially been vacant for several years while collections poured into the museum, thanks to the new mission, I actually had to process a path to my desk. <laughs> um, there, there are three full-time staff in our library. We have a director, a cataloging librarian, and me. I do accessions, processing, reference, digital preservation, collection development, outreach, teaching classes, tours, the works. The Strong has three categories of our cool materials. First, those related to the study of play, original data, observations, research, reference, and manuscript materials from play scholars, educators, and various academic disciplines. Um, collections include those of Brian Sutton Smith, who was one of the foremost play scholars of the 20th century and the namesake of our library and archives, um, records of the Association for the Study of Play, observations and interviews about the correlation between play deprivation and criminal activity in the Stuart Brown papers, and a whole lot more. Second, there are archival collections related to artifacts of play. So these are papers of toy designers, game inventors, entertainment companies, as well as materials created by collectors and players. Again, way too many collections to name my, you know, to name, but we have the papers of Bonnie Erickson. Uh, she created the Muppets Miss Piggy and Statler and Waldorf and many others, along with her own original and licensed toys and professional sports mascots. Um, we have the papers of Phil Orbanes. He's the world's foremost expert on Monopoly and Park. Parker Brothers, uh, the Play Generated Map and Document Archive, or Plagmata papers. Um, so those are things like character sheets, maps, drawings, and all sorts of artifacts created by people during the course of playing RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons. 
And as I alluded to earlier, uh, collections related to video and electronic game history. We have the remaining corporate archives of Atari's coin-operated games division, uh, records from computer game companies, game design documentation from notable video game designers, pinball company records, and so on and so on. Um, so notably, the, women, the museum actually began its Women in Games initiative in 2017 to document and celebrate the crucial contributions of women to the electronic games industry, past and present. We've gotten materials from female game designers, projects focusing on girl gamers, and oral history interviews with women in the industry. It's pretty great. Um, we're also working hard to spotlight diverse influences on the industry through materials like the Jerry Lawson papers. Um, he was a Black game engineer and designer of the Channel F video game console, as well as the LGBTQ game archive collection. But uh, I mean, I guess I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Um, since our archives is within a museum, we need to use the museum database to track information about acquisitions. So for example, we might receive a single donation from a game designer, which might include their working papers, which would come to me in the archives, published catalogs featuring their products, which would go to the library, and samples of game prototypes and published games, which would go to our games curator on the museum side of things. So the museum uses Argus.net as its collections database. And of course, it doesn't really talk to any other products. Um, so we, so when I got here, we had two public facing ways of people getting information about the museum collections and library materials, but no online presence whatsoever for finding out details about archives collections. So I at least had Archivist Toolkit at first. <laughs> like a lot of people in the field, I became really familiar with it around 20, uh, sorry, with Archive Space around 2014 um, when they announced the Archivist Toolkit to Archive Space migration tool and that Archivist Toolkit and Archon would be superseded by Archive Space. I attended a two day workshop that was hosted by our area's regional library council, which helped me to bring it to the attention of the necessary museum staff. We ended up self-hosting our instance and we joined the archive space community as a small level member. Our IT director was actually able to do the metadata migration from Archivist Toolkit for me and I was using the internal side of archive space by 2015. And it took us about another year to get our public facing module up and running, but this is where we're at now. Uh, I still need to use the museum database for initial acquisitions, but I, of course, use archive space for all additional internal steps as well as for our public facing archives catalog. So our internal side, um, besides, you know, holding all the information about all the contents of your collections, the internal side is fantastic for statistics tracking. How many times does a supervisor or colleague ask you for numbers? Like how many acquisitions did you bring in during a certain year? How many collections were processed during a specific period? And of course, they ever existing question, how large is your backlog? Um, I should mention right now, we're actually running version 2.5.2 and I'm, I'm slated to get the upgrade to the most recent version from our IT team this year, but that's, you know, that's, that's the gist of it. So some of the main records that we do use within archive space, of course, accessions. Um, internally, this is used for logging new acquisitions. We don't public, we, sorry, we don't publish these to our public user interface. Um, events, oh my gosh, I love this feature. <laughs> so uh, one terrific part of events is the ability to track your collections processing. So where is a collection on its way to being fully accessible? Like, is it brand new? Is it in progress? Has it been completed? Um, collections management, of course. So this helps me to kind of figure out what our priority is with a collection within the processing queue. So I'll, I'll actually use our um, archives usage statistics, which is something I track internally in a, just an Excel spreadsheet, um, as well as curatorial input to determine the urgency of processing a collection. Of course, there's agents creating personal names or corporate names subjects. Um, in our research library, we use the Library of Congress subject headings for official ones. I also create local terms. As it turned out, a lot of play related terms, maybe toy names or people or video game related information, they have yet to become official LCSH terms. So it's important for me to be able to, you know, create these, these subjects for them. And of course, resources, our collection records, the good stuff, right? Um, so the records that our researchers will find most useful when they're looking at our public user interface. I shout out to the rapid data entry tool because that <laughs> is a real time saver, but letting you create templates for the fields you most often need to use when um, entering objects into your resource records, as well as external documents. We actually upload a PDF version of the finding aid to our website and I link to it from here in our archives catalog. Um, we found this to be really useful for people who still are kind of used to the feel of a paper finding aid and who need to request access to many items which are spread out throughout 
photo collection. Um, so we still actually use paper finding aids here, but all of the information has been already transposed into archive space. And finally, classifications. So we only have one repository here, the Brian Sutton Smith Library and Archives of Play. So being able to easily denote which category a collection is associated with, it's super useful for people to be able to easily see what might be of interest to their area of study. So my internal workflow for collections, I'll just touch on this real quickly because processing naturally followed up by reference. They're two of the biggest tasks for loan arrangers. Um, so materials will arrive at the museum, physical or digital, especially now with more modern games. I'm getting a lot of born digital collections in a wide variety of file formats, along with things like game builds and source code, like truly things I never thought I would have to deal with. Um, then we go to record creation of our accession records. So I coordinate with other museum curators or library staff if needed in case an acquisition is technically across departments. I have to enter any acquisition info into both the museum database as well as archive space. And then the materials wait in the queue. Um, so I need to have a signed, uh, you know, a process signed return deed of gift before I can begin processing a collection. Um, we've kind of already determined their priority based on, um, you know, initiatives within the museum or, you know, is this category of materials getting used more frequently? Do people care a lot about this topic right now as opposed to this? And then, you know, once once something is up, uh, we'll create a prim preliminary inventory, I'll create a processing plan. So this is just documenting um, everything, all of my decisions along the way, basically. I'll do the arrangement and description as well as file reformatting and migration for digital collections if necessary at that point create the finding aid. Um, I'll copy all that info over into archive space and create records as needed, including the resource record. I'll also do digital file and just into our dams if needed at this stage. And once everything's set, I'll publish the resource record to our public user interface. Again, what we're calling our archives catalog. And then finally, I'll publicize the collections availability. So we have used social media, blogs for the museum, either physical or online exhibits, etc. Um, at this point, we have about 200 uh, collections that are fully processed and available for research or use. They range, of course, from, you know, just a few folders of material up to hundreds of linear feet and several terabytes of digital collections. So uh, always keeping busy here. <laughs> and I'm sure as many of you know, and it seems like people are really interested from, um, from the questions we were getting from the first presentation, it's just really useful to have your own process documentation written down, like whether it's for reference for staff members or volunteers or yourself on a bad day or just to you know show to other your colleagues that your job isn't just like blowing dust off of manuscripts and wearing white cotton gloves for the fun of it I mean I guess, I guess it's at least nice that people don't think we just like shush people and like quietly read books all day long um anyway two documents I've created and found to be of great use include our archival processing manual um, we do a lot of theory uh, definitions and guidelines as well. So I start with kind of an overview of archival processing, basic principles of description, processing concerns, how to properly rehouse and label physical collections, our required DAX elements here at the Strong, and then we have a resource and glossary pages as well. And then I actually have archive space metadata entry. Um, it is its own section within the processing manual, but it can circulate on its own as well. And it's a really a how-to guide for our internal side of things. So just the basics, uh, create an accession record, agent records, subject records, resource records, um, how to link information to your resource record, adding notes, creating the hierarchy of arrangement in the resource record, uh, rapid data entry of a collection's contents, linking external documents, and how to use EAD tags for markup in our mixed content note fields. And of course, we use this process documentation to help train semester long interns or archives volunteers. So we'll do a process documentation overview together. Um, I'll have them do a little light reading, uh, typically a few chapters of arranging and describing archives and manuscripts by Kathleen Rowe. Um, we'll work on physical collections processing together, usually at least um, at first a small collection, and then we'll move up to something bigger for them to do on their own. And of course, to train interns on archive space in particular, I created a special archive space training exercise, the art vandalay papers. 
<laughs> so I'm actually now at the point where my interns might not actually get the reference. Uh, but for me, Art Vandelay is a game designer who produced games at Kruger Arts before establishing his own company, Vandelay Industries. Uh, he designed popular console games before deciding to focus on importing games by Chromerica Industries and exporting items from the jerk store. Okay. Uh, so the interns, they'll, they'll create a new accession record, agent subjects, and of course, the resource record based on this sadly imaginary collection. I mean, like, I think it's a lot of fun to practice with. <laughs> so um, I'll just give you a quick tour of our public user interface, our archives catalog. We get a lot of traffic from Google searches about game and play related topics. We also obviously will link to this page or to specific resources, uh, resource records, sorry, in social media, blogs, online exhibits, and more. So our researchers can keyword search from our main page here. There's a bit about the catalog itself and other important online tools that people can use to learn more about the library and museum collections. Um, our IT team was actually able to do a little bit of customization here with the main page. So we have a carousel of scans across various Various archival collections to kind of keep it interesting. Um, obviously, folks can browse by collection title, subject, or name. Our records group tab also holds lists of each classification within our records. Um, so, you know, collection records, the good stuff, right? So, if I just I was searching at this before, earlier today. So Atari, I have 23 collections that have materials related to Atari. So um, we, you know, from our resource record, here's all the information. You can go along, see all the beautiful collection organization there. Um, all of our extra notes, all of our subjects and, and agents. Um, and I also link out um, to the finding aid, as I said before, because some people, you know, they just like the look and feel of this and all the information is actually still in the database. So it's, it's great either way. Um, and they can also always print from here if they choose to do that too. Um, like uh, Sarah and Sheridan at Seton Hall, we will eventually do an integration with Preservica, which is our DMs here, um, which will allow us to link out from an archival object record in archive space to its associated um, digital object in Preservica. So back to this. Um, I've also created a visual like how to use our archives catalog guide in case people are having any trouble getting used to the interface and what our terms mean for them. Um, I just want to mention now I handle a lot of long distance reference inquiries. People contact us, we pinpoint what they need. We can provide reference scans or digital files in most formats at this point for a reasonable fee. Um, and I'll share scans with them using Dropbox. Um, in a normal non pandemic year, we would likely have about 100 researchers on site. And I'd say about 90% of them use the archives during their visits. Um, so the archives catalog does a lot of heavy lifting for me and helping to narrow down people's focus of their um, of their research, as well as like providing um, recommendations for additional collections that they might want to take a peek at while they're here. So I just wanted to touch upon my experience with the archive space community. Um, it's one of the best resources you can have for networking, learning about the program, and having input into the future of archive space. Um, like many of you have attended training workshops, sessions, and webinars that spring up and seem relevant to our needs. Um, I was a member of the archive space nominating committee one year, and then after learning about what the committees actually do. I went ahead and threw my hat in the ring for the User Advisory Council. I actually just wrapped up my term last summer, but while on the UAC, I was part of the reporting subcommittee, the usability subcommittee, the testing subcommittee. So I really learned a lot about the back end of things and common requests and issues from users. Um, I've also been a part of the, a special interest group for archivists integrating archive space with Preservica. And um, if you'd like to join, let me know and I'll put you in contact with them. <laughs> So uh, finally, kind of just a bit of advice for my six, seven years now of being the only real user of the internal side of archive space at my institution. Uh, become really familiar with the Archive Space Help Center. It's very good. Um, be able to succinctly talk about the benefits of the application with colleagues and decision makers. I found it super worth it to be an Archive Space member. So if your organization needs any justification behind joining or continuing membership, just like be ready with that information. Uh, figure out your frequent pinch points. Uh, is it getting upgraded to the most recent version in a timely manner? That might be one of my issues. Um, do you need to restart your indexer often? Are you planning to integrate with any other systems? Um, so if your institution has a very busy IT team, make sure you know how to articulate the issues that you need their help on. Um, technology wise and document these issues so that you can reference them later on like hey when we had this problem two years ago here's what you did. 
Um, another thing is kind of realize that the general public and users of your archives may not yet be familiar with the public side of archive space or really what certain elements of a collection record even mean. So I'm not always dealing with university researchers or scholars or people working on their PhDs. I'm dealing a lot with the general public who has a pinball machine in their basement from 1962 and they want to know like what what should it look like or do we have schematics for something or um, I had this toy when I was growing up. Do you know anything about it. So I'm dealing with like a lot of like general public inquiries too. So we found that creating our how to use the archives catalog guide was very helpful um, as a step by step visual document. And then finally, just I would recommend getting involved with the archive space community. Again, everybody's great. You'll learn something along the way. I learned so much about the back end of things and how, how things are tested and um, people proposing plugins and kind of issues that other people are having too. Um, so like, it's not just me, like other people um, have come up, have discovered these um, pinch points that they've had and come up with solutions for things. And so it's really great to be able to collaborate with folks that way. So. That's it for me. Um, you can reach me at jnovakovic at museumofplay.org. I'm also pretty active on Twitter for the museum at Archives Julia. Thank you, Julia. That was great. Uh, definitely entertaining. And um, I've fully lost control of the chat. Um, it's, a, it's a Seinfeld fan chat now. Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all. Uh, we did get a couple questions in the chat. We are a little over time, um, but of course, one of the questions is, could you provide a PDF or a link to your processing manual? If you, um, yep, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to drop, um, Julia, either. Yeah, I'll put it in there. Yeah. Drop that in the chat. Yeah, feel free to reach out to Julia. And uh, again, Julia, I don't know if you're prepared for the number of emails you may get.